Thank you very much. Uh, it's always nice to come back to Rancho. Rancho is like a second home for me. I was here for 10 years as a clinician, and uh, it's just great. I've, uh, this conference has gone on for the last three years, and it is always extremely exciting. So I have uh, a, quite a challenge here. I'm going to uh, start out with uh, answering the question of how effective is task-oriented rehab robotics. Then I'm going to redefine the clinical problem and talk about a solution uh, which I see in the Rejoice system. Uh, and we're very uh, pleased to have Arthur Prohaska here. He's going to actually give a little talk uh, later uh, in the program about the Rejoice system, but I'm going to introduce it here. Then I'm going to talk about a paradigm shift in the way we look at integrating technology into rehab and go into a little bit of detail about the four nodes of a conceptual framework for research and development of new technologies for rehabilitation that include the recent technological advances, the uh, motivational influences on behavior change, the uh, concept of aging in place, and then the longevity dividend. And then I'm going to give two examples from the Rio Engineering Research Center that I direct, and that's the hat I actually have on for this talk. My co-director uh, is Phil Riccao, he's in the audience, and uh, this uh, Rehab Engineering Research Center is funded by NIDR. Uh, we are at the end of our first cycle, and uh, we are going in for a competitive renewal. I want to talk a little bit about what we accomplished and uh, also acknowledge that this is a uh, Rancho USC collaboration. It's a partnership with Rancho. And then finally, I'm going to finish with a film clip of the future of robotics and healthcare that goes beyond uh, task-specific practice. Okay, so what? how do we summarize the, the uh, task-oriented rehab? And I think uh, uh, we published a recent uh, review paper uh, in the American Journal of Physical Medicine and Rehab and asked the question, how effective is re rehabilitation with current robots? And uh, basically what we, uh, what we concluded was the picture is that current assistive robots are at least as effective in reducing impairment, which is often measured uh, with the Fugelmeyer motor assessment, and this is in stroke. Uh, and it, this is as equivalent uh, doses of conventional motor training without a robot. So the question is, what is, is the robot better? The robot should be better, we, we argue. The, the gap is that training with current rehabilitation robotics does not seem to improve scores on ADL tests, so activities of daily living, real functional tests. And I will just remind you of the ICF model that we're dealing primarily with uh, issues over here in this framework of body function, body structure, impairment level but not necessarily having an impact on the activity and the participation. Our Rehab Engineering Research Center is called Optimizing Technology, Optimizing Participation Through Technology. So we're very interested in using the technology to optimize participation in meaningful and functional activities. So there's a problem here. And so in redefining the problem, I would like to argue that it is not so much about repetitive task practice, which is the message everyone has taken about robotics, but it is more about meaningful task practice. It is more about full participation in the activity. So full participation means that the person is motivated to use the technology and generalizability of the benefits to health-promoting uh, behaviors and cognitive flexibility in life outside the clinic. So we see benefits that go beyond the motor. They go into uh, really cognitive. I mean, we're planning actions. We need to be flexible. We're, you know, functionally, we have to move between actions. We have to sequence actions. 
We don't think about a lot of the uh, movements that we do. They're implicit. And to get to that level, you need to also have these uh, changes, uh, cognitive changes. So here's the uh, Rejoy system, and I'm not sure how I can use this to start this video. Somebody know how to do that? <coughs> We often bring you stories of medical inventions and breakthroughs, but it takes years before these inventions are available to the public. Today, an example of a made in Alberta device that's now literally in the hands of the people who need it. CBC's Brandy Yanchek is at the Glen Rose Hospital and has the story for us. Brandy. Mark, the CBC covered this story in 2009 when the rehabilitation tool Rejoice was in its clinical trials. Today, it's a success story that's changing people's lives. In 2009, CBC interviewed Thor's B resident Ginny Bachman, paralyzed after injuring her spinal cord in an accident. She was part of a clinical trial for a new rehabilitation tool. Rejoice was designed to help patients like Ginny regain their hand, arm, and shoulder skills. The first time I went in, they put on the electrodes on your arm, and all of a sudden my hand opened. I was like, I like that. The Rejoice joystick spring-loaded arm enabled Ginny to play customized video games that improved her range of motion. After using it, she was even able to water her plants at home. Three years and other clinical trials later, the tool is even better and now available to clinics for people like stroke victim Steve Rodden. Like before I used to hesitate, I'd look at something and my, like my arm wouldn't do it right away. Uh, now it's more, it responds faster. Uh, I feel a heck of a lot better than I used to. Andy Prohaska is one of the developers of Rejoice, which his father and another doctor invented at the University of Alberta. He describes it as a clinic in a box because it helps patients who can't leave their home to do the rehabilitation therapy sessions there. In addition to using it in the hospital, you can also send a Rejoice home with a patient and then supervise them over the internet. So for an hour a day, for six weeks, a patient can meet with their therapist online. The inventors say they started offering Rejoice to clinics in January, and it's become so popular they just can't keep up with demand. It's especially popular in China, Singapore, Thailand, and Korea. Mark? Thanks, Brandy. This is CBC's Brandy Janchik at the Glen Rose Hospital. So what is particularly interesting, and I didn't really talk to Arthur about this before I put this talk together, but if you look at the five core principles that Rejoice is based on, they uh, in some sense relate back to this paradigm shift that I'm talking about. So he argues that we need, they need to provide standardized upper limb exercises resent, re representing activities of daily living, they need to disguise intensive training with motivating games. So he's getting into the motivation there. They need to track functional improvements with an automated objective hand and uh, arm function test. So we have an assessment in there, embedded in there, where we can follow uh, improvement. They need to offer patients the opportunity to continue Rejoice exercise therapy in their own homes after leaving the clinic. Uh, tele supervised over the internet. So there's the transition from the clinic to home to the community. Uh, and so that's going to enable the generalizability. And then they need to enable therapists to tele supervise clients from anywhere. So this is moving outside of the, the clinic, which I think is critical. So I think it, we're basically at a point with rehabilitation robotics that is really part of an era of profound change that has incredible promise, some major challenges, and some solutions. And so we need to move forward. So this is my uh, Steve Jobs uh, comic. I don't know if you can read that. It says, to be honest, Mr. Jobs, the last time an apple caused so much excitement around here uh, involved Adam, Eve, and a snake. <coughs> The point is, we, we are having unbelievable advances in technology that are happening so rapidly, uh, and this is really, really good. Um, so we have promise. Uh, new technologies show real promise, and this includes ro robotics. 
uh, VR uh, sensors. We, however, have challenges to translating these advances in new technologies into practice that address real problems. And that's where our feet are being held to the fire. And I truly believe that the solutions will come through effective collaborations between those working in a multitude of fields. So this is not just a motor control problem. This is not just a neuroscience problem. This is not just a uh, psychological problem. This is an issue of dealing with real problems and using the expertise from multiple fields. And so the collaborative science that we are doing in our RERC has really uh, borne, I think, uh, we have realized that we can solve some of these problems much more effectively and efficiently. Uh, and I'm going to show you, for example, how our collaboration with Cinematic Arts uh, has resulted in an incredibly effective uh, game for uh, one particular problem that we are dealing with. So, putting this in a bigger uh, scope here, uh, we can argue that aging is our greatest success of the 20th century. People are living longer, but they're living longer, sicker, and with more disabilities. So disability, in the general sense, has become our challenge for the 21st century. Just some relevant facts. Uh, one in six adult Americans lives with a disability when defined by a limitation in function. That's pretty astounding. Um, Many are at higher risk for uh, multiple chronic conditions, injuries, and increased vulnerability. Comparatively, people with a disability are four times more likely to report their health to be poorer and 2.5 times more likely to have unmet health care needs than non-disabled peers. These are the people that are being treated here at Rancho. And over $400 billion is spent annual, annually on disability-related health expenditures. So this is a big problem. So this is the uh, sort of paradigm shift, the transformative subfield of rehab. We wrote a paper about this, published it last year in Frontiers in Psychology. And these are the four <coughs> nodes that need to be integrated together to really solve some of these problems. And I'm going to go through each of them very, very briefly. But here is really the, the, the uh, synopsis of this paradigm shift. And I think it is true that we see these new technologies as fitting in and being an integral part of prevention, health maintenance, and continued rehabilitation programs useful to forestall the onset of greater levels of disability. That's what we're trying to achieve, and I think it's the integrated part here that is so important. So the technology can't live by itself, and if we focus just on the technology and on advancing that technology, we're missing the big picture. So what are the technological advances? And I've just listed a few here, but this is, uh, we have seen an incredible proliferation of of uh, low-cost interactive media, technologies for health and rehab, mobile health monitoring devices, uh, you know, people are starting to use things like the Fitbit, you know, to measure their activity level. We see interactive uses for the Connect technology. You'll see some of that later. Uh, we have simple emergency notification devices, <coughs> VR and game-based uh, rehab programs. Uh, the use of smartphones, tablets, and computers now by both patients and uh, practitioners. And if you look at developments in robotics for assessment and rehab, if you do a PubMed search just on robotic rehab and stroke, you get uh, 394 hits, 196 since 2010. And if you do uh, virtual reality rehabilitation uh, and stroke, you get 146 hits. So this is clearly a key area. Moving to the next node, we talk about motivation, but do we really understand what that means? And uh, this is courtesy of my colleague, Rebecca Luthwaite, who is here at Rancho. And we talk about motivational influences on behavior change, which is really what we're trying to do. We're trying to be change behavior. And we see that there are three fundamental psychological needs that need to be paid attention to in the development of any technology. Autonomy, 
competence, and social relatedness. And what do we mean by those? Autonomy is the need to determine or feel in control of one's own actions, to be agenic. And I would argue that this is likely why version one of the locomat failed. Um, and I'm, you know, and I think everybody knows this, but the version one was a, was a device that moved the limbs in a normal uh, gait kinematics, but the uh, patient really was not in control. So they were being moved, and I think the, the engineers were very proud of the fact that they were able to replicate a kinematic, uh, kinematically uh, accurate uh, movement of the limbs uh, in gait. But it's not just about that. It's about the patient feeling that they also uh, have some control over the system. And later versions of the locomat really got that and are now incorporating that uh, into, am I echoing? Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Not, not your problem. Second one is competence. The need to perceive oneself as capable or competent. This is sometimes seen as the need to maintain or enhance competence. And this is where, when we give feedback, we can provide a sense of competence, we can foster motivation and also engagement. So. When, when we do experiments where we give people feedback about things, or we ask them, do you want feedback about that performance? People never ask for feedback about performance that they think they did really poorly. They ask for feedback about performance that they think they were successful at. So we want to see that we are competent and capable. So this is another very important aspect of uh, paying attention to fundamental psychological needs. And finally, the last one, which I think any practicing clinician knows intuitively, is this notion of social relatedness. The need to feel included, accepted, or connected to others, to feel satisfaction in one's involvement with the social world. Um, and this is where a lot of social media, VR games with others, uh, can really be uh, beneficial. So if we move to the third node, uh, aging in place, and we notice that we have to close the gap between the evidence and the practice in the community and the home. We can't just stop with a device that is in the clinic and then, you know, that's it. And you publish your paper, you've shown efficacy, and that's it. And I ask people, I say, so when people went home after using this device, what did they do? I don't know. We didn't gather those data. So how do we know that it, you know, affected their behavior? any long-term way. So it turns out that uh, seniors want to stay uh, in their homes longer. Um, and uh, the place we call home matters. Most Americans will spend most of their time in their own home or in a rented residence. If you ask seniors what worries you about the future, the four top reasons are frustration at being immobile, overall effects of frailty, isolation, that, you know, echoes this uh, so social relatedness, and fear of falling, getting sick and being able to take care of themselves. This is an autonomy uh, piece. If you do a PubMed search on falls prevention and technology, you get 281 hits, 101 hits since 2010. So this is, uh, this is a big problem. And finally, the fourth node, the longevity dividend, refers to the economic benefits of ending aging and eliminating the associated health care costs. And really what this is, if you look down here, so we're living longer, but the onset of, uh, of disease is happening earlier, relatively speaking, if we extend life. But if we can delay the onset of disease by keeping people active and engaged and doing uh, health-promoting kinds of behaviors, then we reap the rewards because we reduce the costs, the health care costs, in that period. So we're not ending aging. People are still aging. But they're going to be aging with less disability and less time will be spent consuming health care dollars uh, toward the end of life. So it really is the sum of health, 
social and economic benefits that result uh, from slower aging. All right, so now I'm going to give you two examples from our Rehab Engineering Research Center that we think mirror this paradigm shift. Um, the first one is a uh, investigation into a fall prevention exercise program for seniors. And the second one, really spearheaded by Phil Riccao and his group here at Rancho, is dealing with a uh, prevalent problem in uh, manual wheelchair users, and that is the onset of uh, shoulder pain. Uh, and this stems from uh, a whole series of investigations, both at the biomechanical level, uh, at the uh, efficacy level of a program, and then uh, to reduce shoulder pain, and then uh, the uh, development of a game uh, in collaboration with our folks uh, in cinematic arts. Uh, and so I'm going to share both of those with you. So this, so let me, I think I'm going to need you again. This one on the bottom is uh, the study that we conducted here using the uh, Connect system and a game that was developed by our folks at ICT. Uh, and um, this individual is reaching for virtual targets. <coughs> and you heard him say, bah, at one point. I'll tell you what that was about. And this is the particular part of the study where he's actually stepping and reaching. So he's challenging his balance. We're measuring his uh, leg EMG. We're measuring his reaction time. Uh, we're measuring, uh, we're, we've measured a whole bunch of things, and uh, we're now uh, finalizing the data analysis on this big study. It was 30 subjects. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of the results. But before I do that, Phil, can you show this beautiful segment? This is a composite of the work that was done on the shoulder, starting out with focus groups with both uh, patients and clinicians. This is what uh, an analysis of what happens during a uh, car transfer. And this, mind you, this individual is doing this several times a day. And if you just look at bringing the wheelchair in, putting it in the back of the car, and then the next clip you're going to see is the analysis. So Toyota donated a car to Phil's lab. He instrumented it. And you're going to see some incredible analysis of the uh, forces uh, and the EMG in a minute uh, that is used. You're going to see the right infraspinatus and the left deltoid uh, synchronized with the actual movement that is going on. And in the next segment, when he's lifting the chair in and putting it in the back seat, you're going to see an incredible burst of activity here in the right infraspinatus when the muscle is uh, in a very stretched position. It's no wonder that these folks develop shoulder pain. Uh, Sarah Mulroy uh, and Phil have done a detailed biomechanical analysis of the stresses on the shoulder during these particular activities and uh, have pretty much figured out what movements and what positions uh, produce this uh, shoulder pain and uh, have designed a set of exercises uh, that specifically target uh, uh, these. And I won't